In May of 2021, an Olathe school district coach either, according to a student, described rap music as N-word music, or, according to the teacher, said, we are not going to play music that says, insert expletives, and the N-word. The then coach, Pete Flood, exceeds that he did, in fact, use the N-word. The student and his parents doubt the coach's memory regarding the exact sentence in which he used it. The incident occurred on May 6 of 2021. Coach Flood was fired on May 10. In this episode, A.J. Hopes Flum recounts something that happened in 2005 with the same former coach and teacher long before this last straw was pulled in May of 2021. Note that this episode does feature some strong language, um, not the N-word, to be clear. AJ, it's great to have you. Would you introduce yourself? Hi, it's great to be here. Um, I am AJ Hopes Flum. Um, I am a, uh, currently I work as a job coach uh, for the Olathe School District. Um, so specifically my job is to work on social skills and uh, work skills with our uh, special education department. I work primarily uh, postgraduate. Um, in the 18 to 21 year old range before they go on to um, be part of like adult disability services or group homes or whatever their path may lie. Um, in after I do that in the day, uh, my other job is I work as a uh, as a school director for City Motion, uh, which is a dance studio in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and has been around since the 1980s. And I'm very excited. It's my brand new job. So. Awesome. Congrats. Thank you. Uh, so you, you posted, um, so, so we went, listeners will know, I should just, I should just claim this. I I've been, uh, really leaning into the fact that I think I went to a really interesting and great high school and I keep having guests on the podcast from Olathe North. So AJ is another one of my, 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 uh, classmates from Olathe North. Um, and, and recently, uh, the football coach, um, well, actually, I guess he had become the baseball coach, yeah. uh, was fired um, mm -hmm. over uh, making a, a racist comment using the N-word. Yeah. Um, uh, and when we were kind of on Facebook and there were comments going about that, you told a story um, mm -hmm. about uh, an incident that you had with, uh, with this person, Pete Flood, we're going to put his name in here. Um, and, uh, I'd love to hear that, hear that story if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, this was around when his, uh, first or second year of teaching uh, was happening and he was originally hired as, um, the, uh, as the football coach for, uh, for Olathe the North. Um, and he was really at that time kind of seen as like this, like big energetic presence for the, for the school. Cause he was like going to really reshape the football team and like get us the championships, which. Who which cares? he did. He did. I, yeah. I mean, he did, he did like to his credit, he's a good coach. <laughs> sure. Uh, he, uh, he was, uh, teaching social studies, um, uh, really ancient history. Um, and I was taking his class. I think I was, a, I want to say I was a junior. I might've been a sophomore, but I feel pretty firmly I was a junior then. Um, going into his class, I just kind of already knew that it was going to be a kind of sucky environment. He was one of those people who very obviously favored the more traditionally like masculine, very white males. Um, and his kind of a favorite. pull up by your bootstraps, like pull up uh, by. Oh, he definitely uh, used that yeah. phrase multiple times. The pull, pull up by your bootstraps. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was definitely a thing. Uh, yeah. So he like favored those kind of, kind of people. And then he also like really favored like the really super pretty, like cheerleader, uh, blonde, blonde haired girl types, which was also, I think it was like a pseudo sexual thing. I think it was more just his. And his idea of valid person is a white cisgendered heterosexual person. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he was constantly playing like super crazy country music all the time. So it was just like, that was the environment to his class all the time. Uh, okay. I, I just want to say for the record, uh, Olathe is a suburb of Kansas City. Though he played country music, I, uh, I I would like to distance myself from country music as a as a school. Um, I mean, like uh, Chris Stapleton's fine, but Olathe is not in the country, though it is in Kansas. I just want listeners to know that. Don't get the wrong. It idea. really is not in the country. Like I, I know that probably no one, uh, no none of your listeners have ever heard of Olathe, um, but it's 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 part of the it's a suburb of Kansas City, um, so it's it's not urban but it is it is suburban and there's there's things here it's not like we're surrounded by a bunch of just trees and i mean there are haystacks here and there (laughs) yeah i did i did i do remember to get to one of the highways i did pass some cows uh i remember (laughs) being teased for that uh by some friends in washington dc (laughs) that they did they thought that was pretty funny yeah. Um, so yeah. okay so you're painting this yeah. picture uh, ancient history pete flood yeah. very uh, macho very uh, macho kind of dude. traditionalist uh is that that's not the right word is it well, i don't know maybe it is i mean he was definitely one of those people that like you know obviously like political ideologies are not always going to uh, adhere to like a certain look or type of person though they tend to do he was one of those people where you like walked in you instantly knew he was like one of those quote unquote good old boys, which in my head is automatically super duper racist um, or just super duper conservative. Um, So like he was already kind of a dismissive teacher in the way that his teaching styles were because he did everything via PowerPoints and would have students read out the PowerPoints verbatim. And then like there would be a minor discussion, but it was very much obviously gleaned from the textbook. It was pretty much he just copy and paste it to different parts of the textbooks and then just threw it up. And then there would always be like 10 minutes before the end of class where people just kind of did nothing, just kind of fooled around. And he would always, you know, pal around with, again, those same kind of people that I mentioned earlier. Um, so I was in his class for probably about a month or two. It was around September. Um, so it really would have been only a month. Uh, he made some comments with uh with other students uh you know as part of that 10 minutes of kind of that palling around thing that he used to do and made a couple of comments where he said that like the middle to be turned into a parking lot um for september 11th and that like all of those muslims should be you know part of that parking lot essentially um and you know that was Something so we that said the I Middle could, East should be turned into a parking lot with a parking lot with along yeah. with the the Muslims who well, along with the citizens, yeah. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yikes, yeah, um, yeah. So it was like I, I, yeah. I think that I'm, I'm air quoting I, uh, I, I'm air quoting Muslims because there's clearly not only Muslims that yeah. live in the Middle East. Um, so when he said that, I took obviously major offense to that, um, and. Whoa, whoa, the next whoa. Not, day not, not obviously I, though like well, because like so many other like, because yeah. because you took action and you did take offense to it when clearly other students either didn't take offense to it or um uh or and and certainly didn't do anything about it, it. So, yeah, give yeah or, or they even disagreed with them i'm because yeah. i mean there was definitely some agreement within uh within the students mostly with the people i was hanging around um so yes yeah, next day i uh signed i took a piece of notebook paper. I make it sound like it's like this big thing that I did, but it was really just a piece of notebook paper that I wrote on the top that uh, I wrote what Pete Flood's comment was. And basically I said that like, you know, the names listed underneath and I had my name at top, um, all agree that he does not need to be in the classroom environment, does not need to be teaching, uh, at teaching this class, especially because the class was so centered around that that like fertile crescent, the uh, the, the like all of the thing, uh, all the things that the Middle East provided to really jumpstart human like human civilization, and then you see something like that. There's absolutely no 
there's a, there's a huge disconnect between what you're what you say you're teaching and what you're actually teaching mm -hmm. you know that hidden curriculum sort of thing um so i you know i made this petition said that he doesn't deserve to be in a classroom and he needs to be either moved from the classroom uh or he needs to be fired and i probably got about i think i got about like 10 signatures from a class of probably about 20 so about half of the class and um, once I felt like I, I gave it about a week and then at the end of the week, I went to uh, the administrative staff, like the vice principal and, you know, showed it to them and said, you know, here's my petition, what you gonna do? And uh, we had a little meeting and it was a lot of like placating type of statements like, oh, I'm so sorry that you said this, you might've misunderstood. Um, but this is definitely not something that we, that we agree with or that he should have ever said, don't, we'll, uh, we'll get to the bottom of this. In the meantime, how about we move you from his class to another one so that you can feel safe? And I took that option because I, you know, as a 16 year old, you're not really always going to understand what that bureaucracy and that, that palling around kind of mentality that um that white racists tend to have with each other and so I took that option to get moved from his class and once I got moved from his class suddenly the whole thing just kind of disappeared I mentioned it a couple of times in passing to uh administrative staff that I saw and they said oh well we're 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 working on it and by the end of the by the end of the semester it was obvious that nothing was going to happen and kind of resign myself to the idea that I was going to have to spend the rest of my um, class, my, you know, my school time there trying to avoid that teacher, which not for nothing, it was a big high school. So it was pretty easy to avoid him. But the fact that I was put into that position was means that the school district didn't really do, or at least the school didn't really do their due diligence to really protect their students and instead chose to protect a teacher mm -hmm. for their interests in maintaining a, or gaining a football championship because that's what education is, winning championships. Yikes. Uh, Yikes. You mentioned, you mentioned some interesting things there. So, I mean, you mentioned kind of uh, white solidarity, like this, this, mm -hmm. this thing that, white people do um, when we're not willing to to address our racism and the white supremacist right. thinking um, this this habit this cultural habit mm -hmm. where we uh, sort of back each other up we back each other up um, unless we um, uh, kind of intentionally interrupt that practice and so you kind of uh, observed that saw that on action but then like yeah, I, I, when you're describing like even that feeling of like having to avoid him for the rest of your time, like that sucks. Like that sounds, that sounds, that sounds scary to me. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I, I grew up gay, obviously. <laughs> and around that time, that was when I was definitely coming to terms with my sexuality. I knew I was very gay. I, I at the time I was, um, you know, I was talking to who the person who would eventually become my first boyfriend at the time. So I was very secure in knowing who I was in terms of my, uh, my sexuality. And sometimes the, and this is like kind of that, where that intersectionality of, uh, of, you know, of um, marginalized people come into play. Um, mm. You mentioned the fear of, uh, and, and the stress of having to avoid someone that in a lot of ways was my daily life in school. And it still kind of is my daily life. You know, as uh, you, you know, I talk, I've talked about this with, uh, with some of my students and with many other people and that like, as a gay person, you're constantly coming out every single day. There's never just one, like we, like a lot of straight people tend to think of their, of coming out as this like one big explosion of rainbow and glitter and like a really dramatic, like meeting with the parents where everyone's crying and where like someone gets disowned. It's, there's that, there's absolutely that. That's the big moment. I come out in many different little ways. Every single time I meet someone new, I have to gauge their potential response. So like, it, like if someone asks if you're married and, you know, I have to gauge this idea of like, do you think I'm being married? I, I'm married to a woman because 
I'm not, I'm married to a man. We're both non-binary. So we're already, you know, disrupting gender norms in the, in the first place, not only by us being in a gay relationship, but also by us being non-binary. Um, and then I have to gauge if I think you're okay with gay marriage, are you also going to be okay with that gender queer representation? And if you're not, I have to decide if if I omit one or both, there have definitely been times, you know, even with some coworkers where they say, uh, they, they, you know, they talk about their partners and they go, oh yeah, they do this and I keep it very vague. Avoid students who I knew were always gonna have an issue and would confront me in the middle of the hallways just because they knew they could, because I would not really do anything because I never wanted to fight. I don't like fighting. I'm more of a pacifist. Um, I, I can throw hands if, if need be. I, I am scrappy though. Being in that environment today, being in schools today, do you think it's any better? Um, oh, for, it is for- absolutely better. Absolutely better. So I, um, the school I work at right now, um, and I'm going to be kind of really talking more uh, from that like kind of gay perspective, but I will also say that in terms of, uh, in terms of like dealing with race issues, it is also way better. We have a diversity council uh, for the school district. It started last year, which in my opinion, great. I love that we have this. It should have started like 20 years ago. <laughs> It really should have, it should have been a thing when we were in school. It really should have. But the fact that it exists is already to, is something to be commended. Um, but like, you know, the school that I'm at right now, there's this big display that gender day of awareness. And it has all these infographics on like what it, like all the different terms underneath that trans umbrella. Um, the fact that like the fact that like your gender expression and your sexuality are not the same uh, because that's a big misconception that people tend to have um you know I remember when I was in high school uh, some friends of mine tried to start a gay straight alliance and they were very much vehemently denied because it was seen as unnecessary which really meant we don't like to make this political statement of allowing gay people to live. Um, Meanwhile, they had, you know, tons of Christian prayer groups um, at the school. Hey, hey, (laughs) hey, hey, don't talk about that. I don't want to have to. Okay, so I'm like cringing big time because that was was sad. That was me. Um, I'm a very different person now. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I I like, you, you know, it's fine. Um, well, I, I don't think it was fine. <laughs> well, oh yeah, it was absolutely definitely a way to like enforce that like straight white um, Christian nationalism sort of thing, especially then. Um, but I understood where people were coming from from it. Yeah. I did definitely like try to avoid those those friends. Uh, you never knew. You never knew if someone wanted to pray with you because that was their expression of love or someone wanted to pray with you because they thought they could save you. Right. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. It was, yeah. Uh, there's a new but, um, but back to the, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry to drudge up bad memories. Um, but back to the point of like whether or not it's good in the school district, I, I think it's much better. You know, I see, I see students in the, uh, in walking in the school's there's, you know, there was a boy who was wearing a skirt on the uh, on the first day back to school, and it was, to my knowledge, it was never um, brought up. If it was, let me know who brought it up. I'll That's right. Hands. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, it's 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 better. I think I think it's better in the um, in in allowing people to express themselves, and I think it's also better in that people take and that the school district takes racial issues a lot more seriously. I do still quite a few old holdouts in both teachers and the paraprofessionals. Uh, go, I want to go back to one thing, uh, talking, talking back about uh, Pete Flood and, and the petition that you raised. Uh, so t- right. to me, there's, there's kind of a story there about um, student voice 
And what would, let, let's, let's go back to that moment. Right. And envision, like, if things went the way that, that you think they should have gone, mm-hmm. what would have happened? Like, let's, let's envision a better world. Like, right. what should be the teacher, the administration response to a, a student uh, petition, student complaint, student, um, student voice like that? I think for me, in order for that better world to have happened, we would have already had the structures set in place to allow that student voice. And I think, you know, I talked to you earlier about how I felt that like there was a lot of transitioning happening in terms of education during our time, um, both in good ways and also in bad ways. And that like nowadays we think of education as being more about capitalism, but there's also a lot of opportunities nowadays for students to really achieve their voices. Uh, I mentioned with the diversity council uh, for the school district that they have now, those, they, they have monthly board meetings and those meetings are completely allowed for students to come in and for them to raise their voices. There are also board members on those meetings who are students. That's one of the great things about the diversity council and one of the great things that um, Eric and the other guy's name is Marquise. Uh, one of the great things that, uh, that they both have really done in the span of just a year um, is really allow a lot of opportunities for um, you know, black students and teachers and custodial staff and et cetera. Um, you know, uh, Latin, uh, Latin American students and teachers, et cetera, et cetera. Also disabled staff, LGBTQ staff, they have big opportunities for student voices within there. As long as the school district reminds people and reminds the students that they have that option. So for me, going back into that time, that structure would have already been in place. And I would have known that I would have had the opportunity to that month go up to the diversity council and say, hey, did you hear the thing that this really super fucked up thing that Pete Flood said? What are we going to do about it? And I think that would have already like, in, like would have created that foundation to be able, uh, I, I don't think I would have even had to have raised a petition if mm. that structure was already in place. Mm. I think my voice would have already been heard and I think it would have just been a matter of constantly making sure that it's heard. Um, what what safety, with, yeah. uh, like, uh, what protections need to be in place for, for right. students like you who, um, who choose to go to diversity council or to, to raise a petition like that um, to, to protect them from reprisal or, you know, uh, well, okay. and yeah, and, you know, as much as I kind of complained a little bit, um, or at least rather criticized the move of the uh, of the school to move me outside of Pete Flood's class, it was also the correct move. It just shouldn't have been the only move. Hmm. So I think that is one way that you can avoid that kind of reprisal sort of idea is that like, if there is an issue between this student and this teacher, you want to try to figure it out between the two of them as best as possible without having to, you know, completely uproot the classroom. But something like that, where I'm already demonstrating that I do not want to be in this room with this person, then that 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 student should absolutely be taken out of the classroom. And also, if you don't keep them, if you don't take them out of the classroom, there should be increased scrutiny on that teacher to make sure that they're that any potential appraisal against their grade punishment does not happen. So you would need to have an administrator um, either potentially sitting in on classes or at least just checking in with the student and also with the teacher Mm -hmm. and make sure that, you know, hey, I saw that this student who just made this petition had five detention this week. That sounds like you're like you're trying to enact some revenge. So we Mm -hmm. need to talk about this and this is going to be a punishment. you mentioned, you mentioned that like having uh, you, you move to a different classroom was the correct move, but it was not enough. And, and what comes to mind for me is that the, what sucks is that 
that fucked up ideology, the the Islamophobia, the racism, the discriminatory language was then allowed to carry on and to uh, infect um, and indoctrinate other students in the classroom. Really, honestly, in the in a perfect world, what the school district should have done was they should have listened to the petition and they should have directly suspended him. Um, before, I mean, I don't want anyone outright fired right away. That's never good for any kind of employment. Um, but for something like that, you absolutely should be suspended and taken out of the classroom for at least a, like, at least a couple of weeks while you guys really investigate and figure out what's going on and talk to the students, not just one student, but also talk to every other one, every other student who's in that classroom. You know, bring in the entire class one by one and talk to them, ask them. You know, maybe one student was being a little, um, you know, like, like, you know, one student is not always going to be enough. You do need to hear every voice, every voice in that classroom. Um, but yeah, he should have been suspended and I should have also been moved out of his classroom if he was not fired. Yeah. He should have been fired. Like, I think like, yeah, the, the time, time, time has proven you right. Uh, as he mm-hmm. has been, uh, dismissed now, um, there were, there were many folks that I think were happy with his dismissal because uh, you weren't the only one who had experienced uh, racist or otherwise uh, discriminatory comments from him in the classroom, which is a total, a total drag. So he's a yeah. teacher for a long When time. the news about Pete Flood broke, AJ said that they felt at first triggered. But then on the news that the district was quickly taking action, they felt a sort of elation or release. They felt... Validate. Yeah, Validation is probably the best way. I, you know, I pride myself on my gut feelings almost always being right. I'm one of those people who just, I look at you and I know pretty much what you're going to be like. And everything I had ever felt about Pete Flood from the first minute I met him to that moment where I, where I did the petition to when the school district finally noticed the kind of person that he was every step of the way he proved me right in exactly who he was. And so in that way, it was validating because I realized that, again, I could always trust my gut on knowing whether or not a person was going to be good or bad. Um, And yeah, I was, yeah, I was validated. When you even talk, I mean, it makes sense to me, like, uh, like as a, something that I feel like I always have to gain from knowing uh, that, that I realize now from as a, as a cisgendered straight white male, like I, right. I have all the privilege and no reason, mm-hmm. no, no survival reason to intuit about people in the way that you've had to, or that people right. of color have to. Uh, right. And that's something that I think that I, I've, I've learned a lot about trying to, uh, to trust people um, right. who have had experiences or have experienced some sort of uh, oppression or, or marginalized status, which has forced them into that like place of, uh, of needing to perceive to survive in a way. And I think, I think that, that's where that white solidarity thing comes into play because mm-hmm. you haven't had to try to figure out who you can trust and who is yeah. going to be someone or who's going to be the person who like punches you in the face. Uh, for just existing because you haven't had to hone that quote unquote muscle. Yeah. You automatically assume because you are a good person, you automatically assume that the people around you are also equally as good because we try to insert ourselves into Mm -hmm. other people as best as we can. Yeah. 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 And I mean, like, I personally think that most people are good. I think most people are also pretty blind and kind of and kind of easily led astray. Yeah. But I think for the most people, for the most part, people want to be good and do good. And I think that's where a lot of that white solidarity comes into play is that you don't have that muscle to hone in on who is going to be a potentially bad person or who's going to be a potentially problematic person, I should really say. And when someone says, hey, this person is super problematic and you need to do something about it, your 
because you never got that gut feeling of bad from someone, you are somewhat incapable of thinking, oh, uh, of thinking like maybe this person is correct because to your worldview, you have one person calling this person an asshole and to your knowledge, everyone else around you is saying, oh no, this is a good person. He says some bad things from time to time, but who doesn't? But it's like how my husband says, or really my husband's father says this, one person calls you an asshole, they might be an asshole, you might be okay. If multiple people start calling you an asshole, you're probably an asshole. People got up in arms about cancel culture. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know that I have like huge, I, I know that mm-hmm. it's important if we want a more just and equitable society, there have to be consequences. Yes. There have to be consequences. There's there was like a, a bumper sticker uh, that I saw um, on someone's car. Actually, I didn't even see it. Uh, a friend <laughs> on Facebook repeatedly last summer was posting a bumper sticker that uh, he or she had seen, um, uh, that they had seen, that said, make racists afraid again. Yes. And, and I think it's beautiful. Uh, mm-hmm. because we, we actually, we, I think that when we have consequences, we actually do need that. Like it, it, uh, the, the inauguration of, of Donald Trump and his ascendancy have, have like increased the, the number of hate crimes that have occurred and have allowed um, it, it invited what was already there that like this the racism that already existed it, it allowed it to come more out into the open and we need consequences which will cause people to rethink their ideologies it's consequences and it also needs to be uh education slash rehabilitation mm. you know that's kind of how i feel i i sometimes what, what people tend to jive at when they when they talk about cancel culture um is usually they they operate under the assumption that people are being quote unquote canceled and then they can never ever work again or never ever do the thing Mm -hmm. and to me if that was the case that's a bad thing Mm -hmm. however if it's a case where someone says something terrible they get their consequence and then they show, they, they, they demonstrate a willingness and a preparedness and also actual actionable change towards fixing that and towards making amends with a sincere heartfelt apology and not an apology that's like, I'm sorry you felt bad about what I said, like Andrew Cuomo. Uh, <laughs> I didn't realize where the line was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know when i greet someone I, I touch them on the stomach you know like excuse me if you if you greet me by touching me on the stomach like we're not we're not okay like that Mm-mm. i i you know living in new york i knew some people who were pretty handsy in terms of their greetings like i definitely had some people who like would come up and just like first time meeting them they grab me by the face and they want to you but there's a line for that Andrew Cuomo, you knew where the like line with, with your with your family. That's great. Like I, I guess yes, with your family, and that's, culture, the thing. that's great. Yeah, this was yeah. Those moments were always within like family or very close friends type situations. It was never like a stranger <laughs> did that. Yes. Um, but yeah, like with actionable change and a sincere apology, um, and demonstrated effort towards changing both your thinking and your environment. That culture is perfect. That's what it's what we want. Yeah, we want we want we want want, we want and need all of us to be willing to admit our mistakes and to grow and change. And there's some people who when we hear it. There's some people who are of the idea that a bad person is always going to be bad. But like I said before, I think most people are innately good, or at least they want to be good. They want to try whatever good means to them. And I think people should be given the chance to try again. If Pete Flood would like really truly apologize for his statements and try to make amends towards the communities that he marginalized and you know act aggressively towards with those statements, 
and you know dedicated a good part like you know dedicated his life towards making those amends i'll be friendly with him again you know i'll i'll say hi to him in a bar I reached out to Coach Flood for comment, but was unable to reach him. I did not reach out to the Olathe School District for additional insight on what actions may have been taken back in 2005. And we don't know how Flood's teaching style or sensitivity may have evolved since 2005. We just know how things ended. Thank you for listening to this episode of Wide Ruled. You can support Wide Ruled on patreon.com slash wideruledpodcast. Find links to articles regarding the 2021 incident in the show notes on brainroot.tv slash wideruledpodcast. Wide Ruled's theme music was composed and produced by Dominique Fields. Cheers.